Welcome to Introduction to African Political and Aesthetic Philosophies. The seminar considers debates on both aesthetic and political practices as they appear within the field of African philosophy, a highly interdisciplinary field, which in addition to art and political theory also includes literature, history, and anthropology. The seminar engages the students from a range of disciplines in order to facilitate a critical engagement with contemporary and 20th century African epistemologies. The seminar is structured to provide a foundational understanding of past and recent debates in the field of African philosophy as they appear in Placide Temple's Bantu philosophy, 1945, and John S. Mbiti's African Religions and Philosophy, 1969, among others. The seminar will contextualize these writings with parallel debates in African socialism associated with figures such as Julius Nyere, Leopold Senghor, Kwame Nkrumah, in order to better observe how these ideas might have been re received or instrumentalized in the African politics of 1950 and 1960. It is imperative for the seminar to not only consider singular contributions to the field of African philosophy, but also view these contributions as part of larger social and political movements, such as Pan-Africanism, Negritude, and African socialism. Finally, the seminar reviews the work of artists who consider African philosophical, aesthetical, and political questions. We will achieve this by reviewing Jean-Pierre Piccolo's film on philosopher Valentin Mudimbe, Helen Zedidi's painting Tears of Africa, and Issa Sam's own writings in Parole, Parole, Parole. The intellectual, intellectual history covered in this workshop stretches across the African continent into the Caribbean, African diaspora, and the European and North African continents. The course is, is led by Zerubizi Moses, who is an independent writer and curator. His essays are published in Timorenga, South Africa, Kulturaustausch, Germany, and C. Ampersand, Contemporary and Germany. His mm. research in curatorial projects include Live Mu City, 1914, to 2014, a series of public programs with the Goethe Center Kampala and the Biennial Contemporary Art Festival Kla Art Unmapped, 2014, among others. He has produced essays on African artists and curators for the online magazine C. Ampersand Contemporary and Zero Biri is currently on the curatorial team for the 10th Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art, created by Gabi Nkombo. He has served as faculty and is alumnus of the ASICO International Art School and has was award the 2015 Stadtschreiber Residency of the, at the Bayreuth Academy of Advanced African Studies. And I will, I will now hand the mic to Moses. Uh, thank you, Patrick. That was a very uh, good introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, uh, do you... Um, Charo has requested that we um, say each other's names. So my name is Moses, as uh, Patrick just introduced. Um, do we want to say our names? Patrick, maybe we can unmute people. The people have to unmute themselves. There is the third, uh, like in the middle, like wait, like here, like there yeah. is the, un there are the, there's the unmute function. Like it's the third, like the fir first thing is hide participants, the second is invite people, and the third is mute microphone. It's just okay. a, a symbol of a microphone. And if a student put a, a presses on this, the, the, the microphone is un unmuted. Similarly to the camera, which is the next button next to it. Okay. 
might I, uh, start with Cassidy. If, okay. Because she is already unmuted. And she's the first in line from how I, I uh, the Hangouts uh, shows it. Cassidy, do you want to introduce yourself? Cassidy just uh, left. Okay. Uh, maybe you, Julia, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Certainly. Um, my name is Julia, and I'm uh, sitting here in Cape Town. Um, what do you want most is by way of introduction, just the name. Well, uh, just the name and, uh, and yeah, I guess for now. <laughs> Good. Yeah, very happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Michael, can I ask you to present, uh, uh, to introduce yourself? I think Michael has microphone problems. But I can ask Mikey. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Uh, yes, I'm Mikey. Uh, um, out here in Portland, Oregon, and um, so it's the in this course. Great. Thanks. Charu, do you want to? I'm Charu, and I'm joining from Seattle. So. Great. Um, OK. And, and Patrick, of course, <laughs> who just uh, introduced everyone and myself. Um, so uh, maybe we can start. And uh, it's already seven minutes past. The class is uh, two and a half hours. And um, I, I have structured it in such a manner that um, I, it will be led by a series of questions that um, that were uh, that I came across in the, in the reading. So I'll I'll just um, go straight right into the questions and the conceptual frameworks. Um, so one of the uh, questions is, what is African philosophy? Uh, this is one of the, the questions, and also a very huge conceptual framework that is about uh, attempting to define the field or uh, define what, what do we uh, mean by uh, African philosophy. Um, another conceptual framework that um, is existing in uh, for this class and also in the three uh, uh, articles is a scientific research um, so what is the scientific approach to studying African cultures and African philosophies and and in which ways does uh, scientific research emerge in in, in in all the in the field and in the various kinds of writing? Um, the other one is education. Uh, education, um, uh, the African languages in, in, in the system of education, uh, particularly uh, notions of the history of education within Africa itself. Um, very early 20th century writing in African uh, literature and in African languages, writing in African languages in general, literacy in Africa, um, and, and, and that is also a, a quite huge conceptual framework. Uh, the other one would be culture as philosophy. So here I'm, I'm thinking about specifically uh, one, one prominent example, which is oral history, um, uh, a field that is, it's not just a conceptual framework. I think that's an entire field in and of itself. Uh, their entire master's programs in oral history, but in African philosophy, it's also a conceptual framework to engage. Um, and in our next class, we will um, try and uh, delve into what is uh, orature or literature. Uh, the other two are quite connected. I think one of them is colonial occupations and, and anti-colonial resistance, and this is also 
a quite uh, strong conceptual framework within um, the writing of African philosophy and in these specific uh, authors. Um, I, uh, I, th I think with, with, with regards to these, I'll, I'll be, um, today, I think I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about self-determination, um, about um, subjectivity, um, colonial subjectivity, uh, and, and also about imperialism and, and colonialism. Um, some of the conceptual questions that um, are explored by uh, Mudimbe, Kwame Apia, and Kwesiri Redu are, what is the neo-traditional? And this is a question that uh, Kwame Apia asks in his article, um, how was the postmodern defined from an African perspective? This is another question that Kwame Apia asks, um, how did African thinkers uh, take up and re-instrumentalize the colonial library? That is another question that, um, actually, <laughs> that's a question that uh, comes up in, uh, in, a, in both Kwame Apia and in, and in Mudimbe, in, in Mudimbe. Um, he talks about the colonial, Mudimbe talks about the colonial library um, and in relation to the colonial library, um, Kwame Apia also tries to describe perhaps a late colonial library, but I'll, I'll get into that um, in the class later on. Um, it's also a question of how do you differentiate between traditional African philosophy and modern African philosophy? Um, what is a, um, is the, account, is the, Christian God the same as the Akan God? It's a, it's a question that Kwesi Uredu um, talks about. Um, what is a conceptual decolonization? That's a question that Kwesi Uredu talks about. Um, what has been the misconceptualization of African thought? That's also a question that Kwesi, Kwesi Uredu talks about, but it's, it's something that um, Kwame Apia is very much aware of, and, and, and Mudimbe definitely tries to expound on at length. Um, how has African thought been misconceptualized? How has formalism been dismantled? And how has formalism been ruptured? This is a question that um, concerns both Kwame Apia and, and, and Mudimbe. He talks about uh, what, how, how form, Mudimbe specifically describes formalism, formalism from a very uh, anthropological perspective, but also uh, trying to understand it as a regime of, of, of um, a scientific study. And uh, uh, Kwame Ape, I think, in trying to negotiate with the neo-traditionals, trying to understand formalism in relation to postmodernism, but coming from an African perspective. Um, can African gnosis be understood spatially? This is a question that um, Mudimbe uh, presents to us uh, in his essay. Um, what about the aspects of history that were unthought or generally negated? That's also a question that Mudimbe uh, brings up. How has history uh, relegated so-called primitive knowledges uh, as absent, as void, as incoherent? Um, that's also a question from Modimbe. How can the modernist characterization of modernity be challenged? That is a question that Kwame Apia asks in his essay. Um, and, and what does it mean to judge the other on one's own terms? Um, that's a question that Kwame Apia also asks essay. So um, before um, we go any further, do, was that all clear? Yeah? Generally? Uh, those whose microphones are un, un 
muted or could you, was that clear? Yeah? Okay, yeah. great. Um, so I'll go ahead to, uh, to talk about some of these details and these questions in, in, in at length. So um, as I said, what uh, the uh, Mudimbe presents to us the proposition that knowledge about Africa is, is, is by and large um, present in the field of anthropology in, in, in the Western world and particularly cultural anthropology. And um, uh, he talks about what uh, the study of anthropology uh, claims to do, well, what we understand, I think, now. The study of anthropology claims to understand um, the cultures and norms and political practices of a given society. In, of course, Merriam-Webster, it's the science of human beings, uh, especially the study of human beings and their ancestors through time and space, and in relation to physical character, um, environment and social relations and culture. So studying a people, studying a culture, uh, for me, it's a question I have to ask. It seems innocent, but uh, um, I think there are many ways to, to, to challenge such a position. What does it mean to study a people? What does it mean to study a culture? And uh, who claims to study a culture or a people? So uh, this directly relates to another question that I want to ask. Uh, of course, it's a question that um, uh, that uh, Kwame Apia brings up in his article, you know, uh, what does it mean to judge the other on one's own terms? So, um, and this is in my idea, of course, far from innocent. What methods of study are available to study an entire people or an entire culture? And um, is, is something um, but uh, when you think about the history of European anthropology, um, yeah, it was really until people like uh, Le uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss and a little bit earlier um, that um, European anthropologists realized these biases in, in cultural anthropology and in the field of anthropology itself. Um, so uh, Levi-Strauss, I think, claimed to practice a self-reflexive anthropology, incorporating self-examinations of existing anthropological methodologies. But um, uh, this came really quite late into the 20th century. So that means you have uh, you know, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries uh, volumes of anthropology on uh, on Africa, you know, to contend with. Um, it's not unusual to to think about the relationship between that knowledge of anthropology and the methodologies employed by Britain, for example, in in parts of Africa, uh, meaning that. Uh, anthropology became a site of colonial domination or became a site of, of colonial methodologies. Um, here I'm specifically talking about the British Museum and, and associations in relation to the British Museum. I'm talking about um, the Royal Society, the Royal Anthropological Institute and, and institutions like that in, in England that um, developed sophisticated scientific methodologies to study parts of Africa. What we understand by colonial what what we understand by colonialism um, I think can be further unpacked also. So um, colonialism is 
define is, I think, the specific form of cultural exploitation that developed with the expansion of Europe over the last 400 years. Um, uh, colonialism is almost always the consequence of imperialism, and it's the plant implanting of, of settlements on distant territory. This is, you can find this in the anthology on, um, on post-colonial studies. It's a key concept, key concepts in post-colonial studies. Needless to say that the study of cultures outside of Europe, um, more so the study of cultures became something that uh, shaped a methodology, with, as I was referring to earlier, a colonial methodology. And um, so uh, Modimbe, if you read in his text, he talks about what is the function of science uh, within a colonial framework. Um, how does function, how does science function in building a colonial methodology and um, what is the function of formalism in cultural anthropology? How do we understand, um, how do we understand the application of formalism into uh, studies of African people, essentially? When Kwesi Redu uh, suggests that we must think of a conceptual decolonization, um, he believes that decolonization is um, and colonization are of a conceptual nature. And, uh, and he, in, in trying to argue for conceptual decolonization, he's arguing that um, we cannot continue to use the same conceptual frameworks as 18th and 19th century anthropology to decolonize. So we have to transform decolonial methods to incorporate new conceptual frameworks um, other than those used in, in, in scientific um, uh, studies of Africa. Um, as somebody who comes from Uganda, um, uh, I think that uh, language is, is a site uh, in which we we can see the function of colonialism. Uh, education is a site in which we see the function of colonialism. Capital is a site in which we see a function of colonialism. Um, and uh, one of the most pertinent ways in which colonialism is currently sustained is through cap is through capital. Or, or colonizing uh, capital, if you uh, would like to refer to it. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm talking about multinational companies and, um, and the way in which they, uh, uh, multinational companies collaborate with, with policy and government to, to create displacements of, of indigenous persons. Uh, on their own land. I think this is not unusual. It's been occurring since the 20th century started and even before. But when you're talking about uh, multi multinational capitalism or a kind of neoliberal, uh, very early uh, neoliberal um, structure, it continues to, to be one of the most dominant ways in which colonialism is perpetuated. In terms of uh, cat categories uh, that we use um, to describe African cultures and, and categories that we use to describe African peoples, um, especially what some describe as African art, is um, for me coming out of this legacy again of, of imperialism and remain centered in a kind of Euro European mold. mold, mold. So the dispute as to whether African art exists or African art does not exist is a question that German, French, English, and Italian art historians um, ask themselves. So they ask something, they ask the questions, is there such a thing called African art? Um, and 
it's something that British anthropologists would ask. It's something that uh, you know German anthropologists uh, would ask. So these categories obviously are steeped in the 18th century and in the 19th century, and um, I'm also thinking about uh, 16th or 17th century forms of anthropology um, and how those uh, forms of anthropology fostered a, a kind of cultural uh, appropriation um, or cultural exploitation um, that had to do with categorizing things from a remove, from a, you know, you're categorizing things in Africa from Barcelona, categorizing things in Africa from London, categorizing things in Africa from Paris. Um, and so it's, um, it's in a sense imperialistic because it's centralizing the discourse in London about something that's going on uh, in East Africa or in South Africa or in West Africa. So, you know, about the modernistic characterization of African art, you know, the question is, is also about what modernism is. So what is the subject? Who is the subject of modernism? Who is the modern subject um, is a question that Toni Morrison, the novelist and theorist, um, asks. And for her, the slave is the first, very first modern subject. Um, she asks the question, you know, whether slaves, um, well, it's because slaves were the commodity of, of, of modernity. Um, and um, I think there's also a challenge here because uh, for me, I think there is a, a kind of secondary commodity when we have to think about anthropology and, and scientific studies of, of parts of Africa and Latin America. Um, because uh, the, of what these studies revealed, you know, and, and what these, the creation of the plantation and the creation of um, ex kind of uh, plants and fruits and, 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 and um, created the subject of modernity into an object perhaps something that is not a person, but really um, something that is more um, of an object, a fruit, um, uh, a plant, you know, uh, something that is an object. And now we, uh, because we are far into the 20th century, I think, or 21st century, we can really uh, see how um, the object is given uh, priority, how the object is a subject in, in and of itself, you know, when we're talking about cybernetics and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, technology in that sense. So the, the Fred Morton also talks about this relationship between objects and commodities, um, but I, I just wanted to, to point that out as well. Uh, what was the primary subject of the plantation and modern industry that probably was the subject, the, the object, not the subject. So, okay, so those are my opening remarks. Um, uh, we're already 29 minutes into the seminar and uh, I have still quite a lot to, to present or to talk about. But I would like to ask at this point if if you have um, if you've brought your own questions to the seminar and as I sent you an email earlier, um, I think three days ago, I, I requested that um, you come with your own philosophical questions. If you haven't managed to uh, read the texts that uh, that were assigned, maybe you have your own philosophical questions that you'd like to bring to the seminar, and I, I would like us to go into a conversation about those questions at this moment. Anybody has, if anybody has problems with audio, I can reiterate. 
anything. Feedback. Sure. <laughs> Please, that would be quite nice, actually. Patrick, do, do you want to reiterate first or? No, I mean, if somebody uh, can't uh, say, uh, say the questions, they can just write it down in the group chat and I will reiterate what is written there to the class and to you because it's better to have it in spoken word than for people to sit in silence and read in the video. That, that, that was what I was trying to say. Sure, sure. So, so uh, any questions yet? I will. The... Uh, let me enter. Yes, Tara. Tara. Sorry, but oh, Michael and Sharu have questions at the same time. So, should we? We'll go with Sharu first and then Michael next. Yeah. Well. Is that okay, Patrick? Okay, I'll go with him. Okay. I mean, you don't have all the rights in, in, the, ch in the chat. If your audio works, it's better to he hear your wonderful voices. But if somebody has a problem with their recording device, then I'm offering my voice just so that nobody thinks I'm telling you, you have to listen to my voice, reading what your thoughts, <laughs> just as a reminder. So I'm reading yeah. now Michael's uh, uh, own thinking on the topic. That is his comment. Okay. And, and, and Sharu? We sadly can't hear you. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, I actually uh, had a question that relates to the real opening uh, of Mudimbe, uh, Invention of Africa. Yes. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on something I hadn't noticed, even though I've read this book before, uh, till just now, that he dedicates it to the memory of James S. Coleman. And Coleman was the one of the past presidents of American Sociological Association and has a very particular role. So I, I was really hoping yeah. to, to talk about that because was it yeah. ironic or was it an acknowledgement of how, you, how we are in Western thought? I'm trying to make sense of what it means for Mudimbe to start with uh, a dedication to a colonial sociologist, I guess. Yes, yes. Um, should we go? Okay, I'll, I'll maybe I'll start with with Michael, and then we'll go with um, Sharo. So, uh, Michael, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, uh, I don't know if you can all see Michael's question. It's it's right here in the group chat, um, and uh, and and Patrick uh, read it uh, earlier for us. But he's talking about um, the critique of the concept of freedom as it used in Western political discourse, and uh, he talks. He reiterates that um, the point of the slave as being the fundamental subject of modernity is a huge aspect of his own thinking. Um, so uh, the first thing I would maybe point out um, uh, or maybe try to provoke, push you on and, and then you can uh, maybe respond is uh, maybe not now or later if you if you would like is um, and, and perhaps anybody else in the in the classroom wants to also contribute, please contribute to this specific question as well um, is uh, creating the dichotomy between, um, not dichotomy, but I think uh, the, the way you've uh, phrased um, a critique of the concept of freedom um, within Western discourse and, and didn't, then to describe the slave as the fundamental subject of modernity. 
Um, I think the, 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 the idea of, of, of freedom itself, I think, uh, is something that uh, I'm not so sure I, um, I, I, and I see it very closely within African philosophy uh, in the same way as it appears very, very frequently within Western political discourse, such as uh, Marxist discourse or uh, the in the revolution, um, revolutionary discourse in France, for example. And um, the term that I think comes across very often is liberation. Um, liberation uh, comes across discourses from Ghana, for example, or uh, dis discourses uh, from South Africa, uh, discourses um, uh, that pertain to uh, trying to dismantle um, formal and political structures of colonial uh, enterprise or uh, structures of, of colonial capital, such as plantations, uh, where you have uh, people trying to escape from plantations. People have used the word liberation a lot. So I would, um, coming from trying to contextualize in this class, also try to make the connection between liberation and, and slavery. What does it mean for slaves to be liberated uh, of, uh, of capital? So, um, Moses, your, your audio is uh, laggy. Could you try to change the, um, the, the bandwidth usage? It's, uh, it's the Patrick. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll write it here. Uh, uh, your, audio, your audio is laggy. Uh, here. Uh, yes. uh, one sec. Um, is it fine now? No, it's fine. Okay, oh, no. great. No. Um, I mean, if, 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 if this happens again, it happens sometimes in Hangouts, there is this small mountain button, as I like to call it. It's called adjust bandwidth usage, and you can just turn it a little bit down. And yeah. I mean, I can force it all upon you, but it's better if you do it because forcing it upon you is 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 a little bit uh, harsh, and it will affect the whole class. Also, I mean, it will uh, it will degrade the quality of the video for all the people. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, okay, I'm, uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm going to continue with this this question of, of uh, I mean, first of all, I think there's two things that I think I'll, I'll propose to, to Michael. One is the concept of liberation, specifically uh, in, in a Southern uh, context and Southern political context. And in by Southern political context, I'm just talking about political history in, in, in in countries such as uh, Ghana and in countries such as South Africa, in countries such as uh, Kenya, for example. Um, liberation and liberatory discourses do not always lead to freedom. That's the other uh, very strong, uh, I think, idea. Um, when we talk about um, Fanon, who people like to cite all the time, uh, and who is obviously at the forefront of a lot of discourses related to um, to uh, Africa and 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 particularly to post colonialism. I think uh, Fanon uh, Fanon is uh, very much influenced by the discourse of freedom as it appears within Marxist philosophy um, as a political philosophy, as a, as a term in political philosophy. But when you think about um, the actual political history that's going on in West Africa and in uh, 
mid and North Africa in, in the, the 1920s, you have a lot of projects that are trying to move towards a kind of liberation and they don't always use words like freedom and liberation, but the word liberation from, uh, comes up uh, every now and again. The term native is something that comes up very strongly. Um, native associations, native organizations uh, comes up very strongly, but that is for me an ontological question. So people are trying to negotiate a process of liberation with another process, which is one of um, uh, which is one is an, an, an ontological process of trying to redefine what the parameters of political participation are. So um, how does one define oneself? Uh, notions of self-determination uh, emerge in, of course, the late mid to late uh, 19th century. And I think we cannot ignore these uh, discourses. This is, uh, of course, I'm talking in Africa, but this there's a parallel conversation happening in Europe at the very same time and in the 18th century as well. Um, but it doesn't happen in the same way. So uh, creating a comparative between the, I don't know if I, yeah, I think creating a comparative between the um, intellectual histories and, and political histories in the late 19th century would be a, a very good project um, or a very good, a, start, a good way to, 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 to start that uh, conversation. That would be my perspective. Does somebody else have some thoughts on that? Mm. Michael Rada, uh text in the group chat. If you want, I can read it for, for him. Sure, yeah. So Michael says, yes, I think liberation is very important here. That brings things back to Aristotle, even who defined liberty negatively as simply not being a slave. So his concept of being a, at liberty is predicated on their being slaves. In the context of modernity and colonialism, I think we can see that modernist political thinking is not too far from the political thinking of Mediterranean antiquity. What I'm trying to do is to figure out how to conceive of freedom without con conceptually presupposing the existence of a class of slaves that serve the class of free people like we have in colonialism and in the dichotomy between proletariat and capitalist. I think your points about the difference between liberation and freedom is very helpful in thinking about this problem. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and then Charu responds, uh, would that not require reading uh, chattel slavery as equivalent to pre-modern slavery? Um, I mean, I think uh, just going back to Michael, I think, um, I think, yes, I mean, you're, uh, the term liberation, of course, is something that appears in Western philosophical thinking in, in uh, Gratia and uh, as back all the way back to Aristotle, I think, you know, um, but I think when you think through modernity itself and, and, and the period, the modern period, um, the subtle differences, um, I think, in, in political history um, dictate the, these differences. So um, I would urge for a more uh, critical historiography, um, as, I, as I said uh, prior, um chattel chattel slavery uh, as as a wait uh, i'm going to now move to uh charu's uh, uh point about mudimbe 
uh, dedicating his book to uh, James Samuel Coleman. Um, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I think this is a very, very, very powerful point. And, and as we'll see in the film about Modimbe, um, that um, Jean-Pierre Becolo makes, um, he is a very strong affiliate of the anthropological uh, the an anthropological uh, institutes, the anthropological associations, and and he's somebody who has been a very strong authority in the field of anthropology by and large, through a post-structural uh, uh, school of a uh, post-structural group of thinkers. But he is some somebody who is definitely part of the field of anthropology by and large. So the, the, the communication and the play, what's going on between um, what Mudimbe is actually pointing out in the text as regarding scientific methodologies, scientific approaches used to study Africa and African cultures is also something that he was trained into and, and it's something that he, he was brought into uh, so there is a there is a strange uh, thing going on there. There's a strange kind of conflict. He's not divorced entirely from anthropology and and and, and scientific discourses themselves. And I, from what I have heard, um, uh, many other African philosophers find Mudimbe to be extremely scientific and extremely. Um, they make the argument that he is, you know, reinforcing a conceptual framework that is Western. Yeah, so I actually had to get some help in translating that Latin epigraph thing because oh I was God. like, I could not make sense of this and I don't know Latin, I mean. <laughs> and when I read it, it says that... Uh, for uh, death, because it is through death that you reach light. And apparently this is a very famous Christian saying. I, I also don't understand a lot of the Christian references. So, you know, um, but uh, so I was wondering about that in terms of your discussion of colonial knowledge and history, because yeah. it felt to me that there were almost two paths. And I was hoping you could talk about them a little bit and their relationship, uh, especially to some of your comments on formalism and the need to end formalism. One seemed to be uh, a recovery of indigeneity. This is something Fanon has talked about. This is the idea of uh, a modern expression of the native, if you will. Uh, so you, you see this in uh, ideas of recovering not necessarily as in returning to a glorious past, but recovering native languages, native vocabularies, native concept systems, if you will. Uh, and another is the kind of thing that Mudimbe seemed to suggest, which is that you, in some sense, indigenize philosophy, which is a different kind of project, one yeah. where you work through existing. And so I kind of think of uh, Michael's question yeah. as a really very Mudimbe kind of question, yeah, uh, which I, I will own, I come from that frame myself. I'm earlier generation, I'm trained in mm. Western Marxist thought, but yeah. it is two projects. And I was really wondering, especially outside social sciences, yes. what those projects look like. Thank you. I think that, I think that's a, uh, a really, um, a really, uh, provocative and, and also uh, a good question to ask, uh, well, or a good uh, position to have, because I think that you, I think actually clarifying Mudimbe's uh, uh, strategies, um, when Mudimbe talks about the colonial library, for example, it's far more confusing than when Kwesi Wiredu talks about the colonial library. And Kwesi Wiredu actually 
his text about decolonizing African philosophy doesn't actually refer to a colonial library. Instead, he talks about traditional African philosophy and modern African philosophy. Whereas Mudimbe talks about a colonial library, so you confused whether Leopold Senghor is part of a colonial library or whether uh, Jean-Paul Sartre is part of a colonial library or he is only talking about anthropologists from the 19th century writing about Africa. And because his scope is to go all the way back to the Greeks uh, uh, and the philosophers and the writers, he's, it becomes even more confusing what a colonial library consists of in, in Mudimbe. So, um, Yes, I think there is a, a, a very strong, it's, it's something that um, Kwame Ape actually, I think, has much more of a, a sharp edge against. He says, how do you define the other based on, on, on one's own terms? If, you, if those terms are Marxist philosophical terms, yes, that is a process of understanding um, the other from, from Marxist. Uh, political terms. Um, Julia has a question. Um, Julia, maybe could you uh, just say your question a bit more because uh, um, I think it's something that <laughs> in my notes I'm already sort of getting into, but uh, maybe you could talk about it. Um, yeah, I think I don't come from a background in sort of critical discourse, so there are these terms that are being um, spoken, and yes. I guess I'm just not sure how to frame an understanding of where the term are you know originated, whether in cultural anthropology, if it's okay, specific so, to yeah, where where it originates really. Okay, so the term uh, formalism. Uh, wait, give me one second now, Patrick. Okay. I don't. I don't remember how to um, <laughs> how to bring up the screen, but um, I'm going to try. It's the green button next to the blue button under the chat button. You mean the screen share that Mo showed us in the beginning? Yes. So uh, <laughs> I, I have a dictionary of of of, of uh, Cambridge's dictionary of philosophy. Um, and that, uh, that's why I, I was referencing the word uh, formalism from. Okay, I, I want to be able to use the Patrick notes loading now, and then I'm going to um, find the formalism here. I'm going to go to the application window. First, you press the green button, and then it pops up your entire screen, screen or application window. And I suggest using application window and then going to the the very program you want to show okay uh, let me see if i can share it yeah we can okay. see it it works yeah okay perfect uh oh yes okay aesthetic formalism uh, so I don't know if this is the actual article as well, but yes, so aesthetic formalism, uh, the view that in our interactions with art, uh, with works of art, form should be given primar primacy. Uh, Julia, can you see Yeah, that? I got that. Yes, thank you. Super. Okay. Uh, uh, rather than uh, taking formalism as the name of one specific theory in the art, it is better and more typical to take it to name uh, that type of theory which emphasizes the form of the artwork. Okay. Or since, since emphasis on form is, is something that comes in degrees, it is best to think of theories of art as ranged on a continuum of more, um, wait one second, of um, more, one second. And yeah, more formalist and less formalist. It should be added that theories of art are typically complex, including definitions of art, recommendations concerning uh, what we should attend to in art, analysis of the nature of aesthetic uh, recommendations concerning the making of, of aesthetic evaluations, ETC, 
and each of these components may be more formalist or, or less so. So, but then I wanted to um, point out here uh, mm. uh, uh, the reference Kant and his theory of aesthetic excellence not only insisted that the only thing relevant to determining the beauty of an object is its appearance, but within the appearance, the form, the design. So, um, Julia, I think uh, for me, this definition extends to uh, uh, the field of, of, of study in anthropology as well. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't know how to switch back. No. <laughs> I'm back. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. I posted the link to the to a Google document of the second edition of the Cambridge uh, Dictionary. Of, so people can read it uh, uh, without having to look at that particular time frame in the video. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Sorry, in other words, what? No, Julia, uh -huh. what other questions you have? No, no, I'm just interested in th that um, that formalism then links to that object-based study of the, what we would call the native in terms of those um, European cultural anthropologists. Would I be correct that that would be the way, the starting point for thinking around? Well, well, uh, I think it doesn't uh, transfer directly, immediately, but I think Kant's aesthetic uh, judgment um, and, and his theory of fine art, or Hegel's theory of fine art, uh, I, I think philosophy of fine art, are very influential in solidifying what was already happening in, 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 in terms of aesthetic theory in, in, in Europe um, for a long time, for many uh, generations or centuries, I think. And um, those uh, particular strategies were already being implemented in, in studying um, plants, in studying, um, uh, uh, in studying uh, uh, culture, essentially, or cultures mm. outside of Europe. And so how do you study cultures outside of Europe? Yes, you already have formalist strategies. And then those formalist strategies lead to methodologies. And then those methodologies are used to uh, create categories and aesthetic categories, etc., etc. Et Got it. Thank you. We have um, questions by Cassidy. If you want, I can reiterate them. Please, yes. Cassidy, that may, may be a nice segue into questions that have been brought to mind during this discussion. I'm wondering how exactly are we defining or considering philosophy right now? Is philosophy a Western thing? Are philosophy and narrative art opposites? Does the answer to that question differ from different people? If philosophy is critical analysis or the probing into a culture's ideas and systems of thought, how does Africa's varying spiritual discourses and systems of thought make space for philosophy as we conceived of it in the West? How does the metaphysical distinction between form and matter differ that we accept in the West affect how we engage with African philosophy? Sorry, my mic and camera are not working. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to try and hold your question and hold Sharu's Char question as well. Uh, as uh, as more questions keep coming up. I think the question of freedom with Michael, I think, Michael, uh, now this is your task to write a paper. Uh, Michael, are you there? So uh, I'm, I'm throwing this out to you, please. Um, as now I'm officially, actually, this is going out to everyone. We have two assignments for this class. <laughs> <laughs> the first assignment is a personal paper coming from uh, a personal uh, position in relation to um, uh, the topic of the seminar. So if your, your position is the concept of freedom in relation to African philosophy or the concept of freedom and creating a comparative between Western discourses and African philosophy, that is uh, a position uh, paper. 
Um, so that's one of the assignments. Um, and Michael, I, you're welcome to to do that. I, I'm very happy to 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 see where you take that conversation. Um, the second one is um, an assignment about an of a less known African philosopher or African thinker from the 20th century. So it cannot be any of the thinkers that I've assigned in the class. It cannot be any of the thinkers that have major classes and theories and, and, and books that are circulating. It has to be one of the thinkers that we come across who is being cited in uh, probably somebody who is cited by Mudimbe in a footnote or someone who is um, talked about, but talked about much less than people like Ashile Mbembe or, 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 even, um, or even Kwame Nkrumah. So that is the, the second paper. The second paper has to be about a, a lesser known, a less known African philosopher. Um, and uh, these papers, I think, uh, depending on how much uh, time you have uh, and how, w what you can uh, write, uh, but I, I would recommend that there are more than um, 900 words. Uh, between probably between 900 and and uh, and what and I don't know what the top would be maybe 1,000 maybe 1,500 or two 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 thousand words maybe 900 and one we we'll say 1,800 words um, so <laughs> so that it's not too high um, Michael is that fine. Perfect. So um, what is African philosophy? So the question of uh, what is philosophy itself? Philosophy is a careful thought about fund the fundamental nature of the world. And it's the grounds for human knowledge and the evaluation of human conduct. That's uh, philosophy is the rational and critical inquiry into basic principles. It is the discipline concerned with questions of how one should live, um, it, what sorts of things exist and what are their essential natures um, in metaphysics or what counts as genuine knowledge in epistemology. And what are the correct principles of reasoning, logic? Uh, but what, another question, what is African philosophy? So if that's what philosophy is, uh, because this is a philo these are the perceived definitions, what is African philosophy? So according to uh, Chame Jeche, uh, African philosophies, his article, African philosophy in the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, um, Patrick, if you can find it, it'd be very good. I have a copy here on my computer, but I can't bring it up. Um, it, is it part of the syllabus? It's not in the syllabus, but it's it's in the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, the same one that had formalism. There's a there's an article on African philosophy. I'll find it. I hope. Okay. Okay, great. But African philosophy is, uh, uh, according to Chame Jeche, African philosophy is the philosophy produced by the pre-literate pre, pre cultures of Africa, distinctive in that African philosophy is the traditional setting, in the traditional setting is unwritten. For some, uh, someone who is in, interested in studying um, oh oh yes yes Chara we can um, find the PDFs uh, for someone who is interested in studying say Chinese or Arabic philosophy the written works of the individual thinkers are available but in African philosophy uh, with the exception of Ethiopian philosophy um, there are no written philosophical uh, works um, the lack, 
the lack of written philosophical literature in Africa's cultural past is the outstanding reason for persistent skepticism about the existence of African philosophy often entertained by scholars. Um, so there are some who, who would withhold the term philosophy from African traditional thought and, and would reserve the term for philosophical works being written by individual African philosophers today. So they would say philosophy, African philosophy is what African philosophers are writing today, not what African philosophy was in pre-literate uh, cultures of Africa. So uh, I think that uh, in relation to your question, Cassidy, uh, that's a, a very strong point about how African philosophy is being defined. So if philosophy is, is primarily in an oral context, is it still philosophy? And uh, in the next class, I think we will try to really examine that and try to examine what is oral literature? How does oral literature relate to questions of human rights, questions of, of African philosophy? and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, Chame Jiche talks about there are others who on the basis of one, their own conception of the nature of philosophy to their sense of the history of the development of philosophical ideas in other cultures. Three, their conviction about the importance of the universal character of the human capacity to wonder or of the curiosity that leads some individuals in various cultures to raise fundamental questions about human life and experience, or for uh, their conviction that literacy is not a necessary condition for philosoph philosophizing would apply philosophy to African traditional thought, even though some of them would want to characterize it further as ethno-philosophy or folk philosophy. So two assumptions made about the character of African traditional thought have earned it those labels. One is the alleged communal uh, aspect. Well, I can we can talk about that. But um, one of the categories, I think, before I go any further, I think is what he's deferring. He's referring to as uh, African traditional thought. And then uh, wh what he later refers to as modern African philosophy. So traditionally, or in, in the academy, modern African philosophy is the philosophy of Kwame Nkrumah, the philosophy of Julius Nyerere, the philosophy of Leopold Senghor. And, and these people are usually referred to as, um, as the a kind of uh, the, the philosopher um, politicians, or I, I don't know, they have a kind of complex term to 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 describe these people because they were both politicians and they were both philosophers. Um, but the uh, uh, when you t when he talks about traditional African thought, he's talking about actually he's not referring to Kwame Nkrumah. He's referring to uh, you know. Um, traditional Akan uh, proverbs. He's referring to uh, traditional Luganda, you know, um, uh, moral uh, and, and cultural ethics, you know. Uh, how do people live in a certain uh, uh, place and, and who are the people who are, uh, who are um, the, 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 how do you call, the philosophical guides or philosophical uh, oracles, if we should call them that, um, who 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 preserve this knowledge in in an oral uh, sense, in a sense of oral history. So he's also talking about a lineage of 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 thought that 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 goes beyond the modern period, um, one that comes from um, several centuries ago, probably, but one which is carried forth in this kind of oral uh, tradition. So what is sage philosophy? Um, if you've come across this, sage philosophy uh, is uh, 
uh, one of the uh, categories established uh, in Kenya by a Kenyan philosopher whose name I will <laughs> give you his called Oruka. He's called Oruka, um, but I will give you his full name because I don't have it right now. And uh, in, in his research into what he calls sage philosophy, he sought out uh, individuals among traditional Kenyans who were reputed for wisdom and noted for their independence from foreign influences and held and recorded long question and answer sessions with them. Uh, in these encounters, the sages expressed their views about various topics, such as the existence and nature of God, freedom, justice, equality, and so on. And, and this is the, the work that uh, uh, Oruka uh, did. In terms of uh, traditional African philosophy, of course, uh, we have the uh, utmost influence of a book called Bantu Philosophy, written by uh, Father Placid Temples, who is a Belgian uh, a Belgian priest. And uh, Temples uh, went to minister to the Baluba of present-day uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and he formed an impression uh, uh, saying that the Baluba had a coherent philosophy that governed their day-to-day -day living. No doubt he remarked that anyone can show the error of their reasoning but it must nonetheless be admitted that their notions are based on reason, he said. So um, when he wrote the book, um, it was it was very much taken up by um, the philosophers I mentioned earlier, especially Leopold Senghor. And um, this is, uh, I think he wrote the, he did his study in the 1940s and the book must have come out in the early 50s. But for some reason I have 1959 here, which would be far too late um, for this book to have come out. It, it came out much earlier than 1959, or it was already in, in circulation. Um, and uh, Temples, uh, it went on to influence uh, a lot of the philosophers who were politicians at the, same, at the, at the time, um, who, who saw his work as, as, as arguing for a written African philosophy. So this is where you have uh, somebody who is an, uh, a missionary, but who is using anthropological uh, methodologies to translate oral philosophies by the Baluba into a written uh, discourse. And uh, somebody who is really incorporated into the, then the philosophies about liberation and, and independence that went on in the 1950s and 1960s. The other question, who is an African writer? You know, what is African literature? What all this suggests to me is that uh, this is Chinua Achebe speaking. So if we, if, if um, according to the, what we've talked about, African philosophy is not, is not written or can be seen as not written, then who is an African writer? Because then can, do, can we actually have African literature? Um, and this is a question that disturbed uh, the, uh, well, that comes up in Chinua Achebe, the Nigerian novelist. He wrote an essay called English and the African Writer. And uh, in that essay, he, he says that, I do not see African literature as one unit, but as a group of associated units. In fact, the sum total of all the national and ethnic literatures of Africa. A national literature is one that takes the whole nation for its province and um, has realized all potential audience throughout its, ter its territory. In other words, a literature that is written in the national language. An ethnic literature is one which is available only to one ethnic group within the nation. So um, in Nigeria, where Chinua Achebe was writing, he said that the national literature, as he saw it, 
was a literature in the English language. So that's fair to say for 19, um, 1962 or 1960, when he wrote this article, but um, is it true that English was the actual national language of Nigeria in 1962? Was that the majority language spoken by all the people in Nigeria? And if we're to define states as not merely documents, but as uh, as um, as populations, what were the populations actually speaking at that time? Were they speaking predominantly English, or did they also speak Yoruba? Did they speak Igbo? Did they speak other languages as well? And so um, Achebe is, in my view, by uh, creating a quite dangerous, <laughs> not dangerous, but a quite um, sharp distinction between ethnic literature and national literature and um i think this this uh, this is quite difficult because to say that an african writer is a national writer um, and that is the foremost definition of what an african writer is is to say that the african writer is purely modern and therefore that we, we can never conceive of an African writer outside of the modern context. And this is not, of course, has gone on to be completely debunked or completely, um, not completely because I think that uh, we still, even, in, even around the world, people in Germany have the idea of who is the national writer of Germany, you know, in some parts of Germany, let's say. Um, but it is a, it's a very, very, uh, uh, I mean, we, we hear that, you know, British novelists under the age of 40, who are the, who are the predominant writers in Britain, you know, and what are they writing? But if that were the first and foremost category of, of, of being a writer, or of philosophy and national philosophy, then what about, could we conceive of philosophy as being, as existing outside of the constraints of the nation, therefore? So could we still say African writing could exist beyond the construction of the nation? And could we still say that African writing exists beyond the construction of national literature? Um, the the part about scientific research, I think I want to get back to because uh, of what we discussed, uh, we were talking about uh, concepts in Kwesi Redu, uh, well, let me, let me talk about it, let me just go through it. Um, scientific research, so uh, scientific research, we, we just mean sociological and anthropological research from the 19th and 20th century, but also the 18th and 17th and 16th century, depending on which, uh, which sources one is actually looking at. Uh, and these sources were used to develop very sophisticated methodologies to study politics, to study culture, to study art, to study uh, music in, in, in parts of the world outside of Europe. Um, I have to make a special note about uh, the fact that, well, a lot of, in the 20th century, um, anthropology built a lot from structuralist philosophies, uh, German structuralist philosophies, which emerged in the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, I think these philosophies had a great deal of impact on linguistic anthropology uh, the writing of dictionaries, the creating of vocabularies. So the linguistic, the, the, the fast, the, the gravitational pull of structuralism to linguistics was something that was already showing the similarities between structuralism and anthropology in the 19th century and in the 20th century. Linguistic studies, um, include the Oxford Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary of, of, of the Luganda language, which was printed in the early 1920s. And um, uh, 
concerning, you know, uh, translation, annotation, uh, phonetics, uh, and uh, and linguistic anthropology, or anth linguistic ethnographers aimed at translating European religions uh, and religious concepts into local languages. So it was uh, the role of the translator was seen as a form of mediation, but as a form of uh, uh, translating uh, uh, religion. The functional aspects of, of, of translation, I think, cannot be ignored in this case. And, uh, and the development of forms of concepts of, of African thought. Uh, concepts of African religion, according to Kwesi Wiredu, who argues for a position that challenges the predominance of what he calls as traditional African philosophy, citing that traditional uh, African uh, he, uh, but citing the traditional Weredu echoes an essentialist strain um, that fails to take into account a sense of genuine philosophical inquiry. And he uses the term retrograde inflexibility, uh, which is also according to him unphilosophical. By this is, I think, trying to say that studies such as the concept of a person in Buganda, the concept of a person in, in, in Luba is uh, extremely um, uh, traditional and essentialist and it's not uh, a matter of philosophical inquiry because of the way in which these, um, uh, these studies of a people's philosophy become, um, uh, how do you call, they become doctrines. The concept of a person in Luganda for the Vaganda becomes a doctrine. And he says that no genuine philosophical inquiry would be able to argue back and would be able to challenge such a position, would be able to have a philosophical discourse about that. Um, so this uh, brings about another um, uh, idea, which is uh, conceptual misunderstandings. Uh, how texts written by European missionaries following linguistic ethnography um, established a traditional African philosophy in which Christian mythology was transposed to indigenous mythologies in Africa and, and for the purpose of evangelizing. So the misconceptualizations emerge out of an attempt at assimilating African thought to Western categories. Inevitably, African myths are not equal to Christian myths. So, um, the purpose of creating this level playing field or horizontal structure in which uh, the Christian God was the same as the uh, whoever, the Luganda God or the Akan God is, uh, according to Kwesi Wiredu, a, a very, it's a misconception, it's a mistranslation. Um, Patrick, how are we doing on time? Uh, I, I, how much more material do you have? I I have some more material. I mean, I, I not too much, but I I have some. I'm just wondering if we should break into another conversation. Um, I think we should actually break into another. I, conversation. I think it's 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 always good to have a conversation. Like if you had like more material that you have to press through then I would say like finish first the material. But I think in this case, let's have another discussion. Okay, great. Uh, should we, are there any questions or concerns? Oh yes, okay, great. Sharu would like a five minute break. Um, uh, when I, I, I view, would use this to, to, to channel the, the, the thoughts of the, of those who have not yet asked the question. Right. We, have, we already 
had uh, something like the ha half of the people, but I think Larry has I have not had an interaction with Larry for for once. So maybe Larry wants to come up with something, or if I'm missing out something, but I think I had Michael, I had Mikey, I had I had I think everything uh, unless Larry. So maybe you want to present us something, or you can ask something. You can ask us to reiterate something that you want to uh, get a second perspective on, something like this. Uh, but should we do it after five minutes? I'm not a big fan of five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we, shall we pause for maybe three minutes? Let's have a three-minute breather. <laughs> but, uh, but if we, ha if you uh, and Jaru want to have a three-minute breather, that's okay. But then I will engage with the students. Because I'm not going to have silence for three okay. minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Uh, yeah. Larry, go ahead. Larry, go ahead. Yeah. And if you don't want to listen to your voice, then just write it down here, and we will do that. But you know, you have to think of the students that will have to watch this class later, and then they will have to wait for three minutes, and then they jump apart, and then it's five minutes. So it's in inconvenient. It's better to keep on talking. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Larry, do you want? I'm also very open for an open discussion with all the students who are currently listening and who have uh, the ability to speak. I mean, I always can reiterate whatever you want to say. And if people don't want to listen to their own voice and don't want to be recorded, sad, but I can re reiterate it however you want it. Hey, so I uh, had a couple. This is a general kind of question I've been um, looking at addressing, and specifically with this course, uh, it's looking at effective ways of approaching um, the writing, like thoughts and philosophies of different cultures, especially um, with culture as uh, a form of philosophy, um, in ways that you know we can be either like generous with it or uh, having access to it in more respectful ways. Um, and to use the thoughts and ideas um, that don't necessarily uh, pull away from it or don't um, take away from the history, uh, I guess, of it or just the context of, of the cultures. Um, and then kind of like a secondary question is, can that form of like uh, uh, naivety be useful uh, in the regions of different cultures? Um, and there, is there a way to do that that is respectful um and this is a question i think that goes along with that even outside of uh you know african philosophy and culture um but looking at even writings of western thinkers of where we never have access to everything you know we're not part of their culture especially within history where there's always something lost so um is, is there is there a usefulness in trying to reclaim as much as we can or can we take naiv as a, a positive when it? Well, uh, uh, I, I would, um, I would, I see. Uh, I think I see parallels between your question and and the question that Michael asked. Do you remember Michael's question on freedom? And uh, I think um, I think the, the the question of freedom, uh, which you know appears very strongly in 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 modernism and in in European modernism, is uh, is something that doesn't actually appear in the same way in what I understand to be post-colonial or even, you know, colonial periods uh, in, in parts of Africa. And, um, you know, um, 
yeah do you ha do you do you see uh, a connection between what you're ask you're asking and what michael asked yeah i mean there's you, it, it's always um we, we i always like you know see connections with you know whatever i read if it if it's completely like a foreign kind of topic and then with it goes to like ideas of freedom you know it can stretch out a lot of ways but there's always something that you know, we're missing, we're missing from the piece of just, we, di we didn't experience what um, they went through and, uh, or like the different kind of aspects that fully went into there. And though we can gain a lot of context through history, uh, reading and re like research, you know, there's always like some sort of naivety and some sort of guessing and filling in the blanks. And especially like within teaching and sharing your own work on topics um, or referencing other writers, you know, it's just those layers almost get to like, a, you know, into back to formalism. Um, and right. Yeah. It always goes back to this uh, very sophisticated uh, methodologies established by Kant and Hegel, and also before Kant and Hegel, because Kant and Hegel were referencing a whole uh, discourse of 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 aesthetic formalism that was already present before they 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 were writing what they were writing and they they advanced it by creating um, another sort of uh, a way to think of it to, as a as a total as a mass of some kind um but yeah i think i think you're totally right um but how how one can think of uh freedom i think um for me the question would ask uh, i would ask a uh, I mean, I, I, I think maybe the, uh, do you, I mean, do you know any, uh, what about Jonathan Swift? I think Jonathan Swift, do you know his work? Uh, I haven't read, no. Uh, you haven't read Jonathan Swift. Um, Jonathan Swift, um, um, okay, maybe, maybe, uh, we could we could actually talk, do this as an exercise. Actually, this is very exciting for me. <laughs> so there's a book called Treasure Island, uh, and Treasure Island is um, a very uh, you do you, you know this book right? Treasure Island. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a book that presents many philosophical problems. Um, one of them is the utopian, which is something that we can think about. What is the utopian? And the other one, uh, I think also is the question of the island itself, the archipelago, what the island represents, what the idea of, of, of something at the end of the world represents. Um, a kind of limit of knowledge, you know, what is this frontier of knowledge that is inaccessible, that is unknown, you know? And I, I would love for us maybe to, to go into an exercise um, uh, maybe right now or uh, later that, uh, that, that tries to uh, maybe later actually in another class that tries to think about um, uh, Treasure Island as a, as a uh, and its philosophy really, um, the philosophy of utopia, the philosophy of, of what is on an island somewhere where we have never been, where we have never gone to. And then I would like to also think about um, how certain African thinkers have thought about islands. So uh, M. S. Césaire has thought about Martinique, for example, as an island of his of his birth, right? So he he's also looking at an island. So he's talking about notebooks on return to native homeland. He's looking at an island, you know, and he's looking at it from across the sea in, uh, in, in France, and he's looking back at Martinique. And he's he's he also has a sense of well I'm I'm returning to this land. Um, so maybe maybe we can uh, create uh, a kind of uh, 
I guess, registry that would, I mean, I don't know if you're interested in the exercise, but it, it would be interesting to create a registry of what is the philosophy um, of the island um, in Treasure Island and to think about other islands um, that have, uh, and to do a kind of comparative. For me, it would, it would, uh, it would really try to um, think about this, again, this idea of, uh, as you were saying, the, is there any usefulness? I think then there will, we start to examine what, what is the usefulness uh, I mean, of course, there's usefulness, but we, we, I mean, can we have a kind of a comparative to think about what is the island and, and what is the utopia in relation to what is the island and utopia and something else? Yeah. Uh, Larry is asking a question. Patrick? So Larry said, however, the definition of post-coloniality, page 348, paragraph 1, by Kwame Anthony Appiah, is something I, I find very punchy and interesting. Moses, can you kindly elaborate a little on that, please? Uh, OK. Uh, Kwame Appiah, post-coloniality. It's the, the Cambridge Dictionary. Oh, it's the Cambridge Dictionary? I think so. I mean, it's just uh, because... L Larry, is it, is it, is it the, is postmodern, the post in postmodernism or the Cambridge Dictionary? Oh, but we can't hear you because it's... Yeah, Larry, you're muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> no. Sadly, I mean, you are you are here. It's, I see that you're unmuted, but there must be some problem with your either the browser or the Hangout uh, plug-in. Yeah. So. You can just type it to the right in the group chat and I'll re reiterate it for you for the now. And if you have any further problems, just write me in the in the, uh, the me a message and I will try to go through the whole process with you. Maybe we'll find what, 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 what the thing is that, that hinders the audio to be present in the classroom. Okay. Okay. Uh, Charu wrote, wrote something. Uh, is this the de definition, Larry? Postcoloniality is the condition of what we might ungenerally call a comprador of a comprador intelligentsia, a relatively small Western style. Western trained group of writers and thinkers who meditate the trade in cultural commodities of world capitalism at the periphery. In the West, they are known through the, Af through the Africa they offer. Their compatriots know them both through the West they present to Africa and through an Africa they in have invented for the world, for each other and for Africa. Uh, and Larry wrote, it is in Kwame's postmodern, postcolonial. So. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a great. Um, he's talking about his father. Uh, Larry, I can't see your, 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 yeah, but he's talking about his father. Uh, and so he, he's directly referencing 
the Western trained group of writers and thinkers are, yeah, his own father, Joe Apia. And uh, I think uh, he, Kwa, uh, Kwame Apia has a problem with nationalism as well. And, and he talks about that this group of, of Western trained writers were very nationalist. Um, but uh, a question that I have is whether this is the colonial library because <laughs> because of how close it 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 it, it cuts with um with um, post coloniality could be a colonial library if we think about its source materials. These writers were were educated in in the West, and they they once that once. Placid Temples published Bantu philosophy. They unquestionably sanctioned the book as the lead authority on African philosophy. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of it is is in that sense. You know, how can we um, how can we push the definition of a colonial library to to exist beyond what? Um, what anthropologists wrote in the early 19th century. Um, but in terms of um, his idea about cultural commodities and, and world capitalism, I think there's a, um, this is something else I think, Kwame Apia is also very pro-capitalism. I don't know why that is or how he is. He, he doesn't classify himself as a socialist or a communist or uh, or a Marxist, he's not even a Marxist thinker. So I think there's a there's a very there's a very um, the way in which in his article he says, well, I'm I'm pro. I I don't think you know commodities are something bad. So African art for me is a commodity as well. It's a cultural commodity. Um, I think we need to also think about what he's actually talking about because he's he's talking about. Um, He's talking about, uh, uh, I mean, I think for me it's uncomfortable to say that post-coloniality is a cultural commodity. You know, it's 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 uncomfortable. I mean, I, as much as I want to say, okay, well, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart was a cultural commodity in London in 1950 something, 19, you know, I, I don't want to, think that that's the only thing that it was. Yes, it was published by Heinemann, Heinemann in, in London, but beyond being a book for sale, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart represented something more. Um, for a lot of African youth at that time, it was the very first time they were reading about a character um, in a book of somebody who they recognized in real life. You know, it was this kind of mirror of some kind. Um, I remember when my own father was telling me about reading Things Fall Apart, and he said that um, the, the um, um, my God, my history of Things Fall Apart is now escaping me, but um, he, he spoke about it in a way that you, I could tell was very close to his personal experiences. Um, and I thought that that was extremely, extremely apt, you know, and extremely articulate, you know, um, beyond what this book meant, what it had been, uh, where it came from, how it had been written. Um, I think he, he, he spoke about it in a quite that, no, I know these characters. I know them because I've seen them in my home. Um, uh, I see them, you know, uh, I, I, they, they, they represent something for me personally. But I think what Kwame Apia also, uh, his definition of post-coloniality refers to, I think, is um, I, think, I think he's also referring to a definition of post-coloniality that um, is about language, largely about language. Um, he's thinking about 
um, how James Baldwin, you know, describes Ibeji dolls, you know, that he has seen in a collection of African art. And um, uh, maybe I should actually pull up the, the actual image. Wait one second. I'm, I'm going to try to find the actual... Um, Can you still, okay, wait. Uh, Patrick, so I'll, I'll try to find the actual image and then maybe I can share it. Um, uh, uh, I can find it really fast. Perspectives, yes, there it is. Uh, Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, open in a new tab. Uh, one second. New window, okay. I think I'm we will interject shortly with Charles. Charles remarked that. Uh, about Apia, uh, but Apia himself is not necessarily asking for an indigenous in opposition to a national colonial. Doesn't he ask for a global cosmopolitanism? Uh, yes, yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he um, he asks for. Um, let me let me get to that question one second. Uh, I'll just try to find. Kwame uh, Apia's. Uh, uh, this is the book that uh, Kwame Apia is referencing in that article. It's. Um, it's an article. It's an article. It's uh, a reprints of of um, the exhibition catalog that he's referencing in that book. Uh, now I can't actually see the talks about. Um, Okay, um, yes, um, I still cannot actually, but um, I, I, I will try and um, maybe f send it to you uh, afterwards, uh, but uh, he's, he's talking about how James Baldwin describes these objects, the ones that we were looking at. And um, and one of the, he looks at one of the objects and says that it it was uh, he's he knows those two those twins he's seen them in Harlem and 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 it's this language that he's using to subscribe to um, these objects. Um, Baldwin is somebody who who did not live in in Benin and or Benin in Nigeria and doesn't really know these uh, about Yoruba culture in that way, but. He has a language that he's using, and and Apia is is interested in what this language is and what it's about. So, but Apia himself is not necessarily asking for an indigenous in opposition to a national colonial. Uh, doesn't he ask for a global cosmopolitanism? That's I mean that's a very uh, intense <laughs> question because it's intense because actually um apia is somebody who is studying ethics like he's his field is ethics so um in in a way when he's asking about global cosmopolitanism um i think it's a very um it's a question where he's still trying to argue for um ways of living together that um, maybe go beyond the scope of nationalism and go beyond the scope of uh, a national elite, uh, a native a native 
elite uh, that that he he perceives of in 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 Ghana itself, and um, you know, asking for an indigenous in opposition to, I think, would be counter up here. Really, I mean, I don't think that's something he is capable of doing. Actually, he brings up. Susan Vogel's exhibition, not so he can reinforce the indigenous, but that he can point out what James Baldwin, an African-American author, has to say about uh, these indigenous sculptures. He's interested in what language can do. And, and I think in that way, he, he situates um, these African art objects in a global uh, framework that is more, I guess, cosmopolitan. If, um, sorry, I just unmuted my mic. If I can follow up a bit on this, uh, the question I have is related to the earlier comments you had made about English language versus uh, oral histories and ethnic languages. Right? Yes. So there's there's a critique of Achebe we heard from you before that he's writing yeah. in English. He's not writing in local languages. Is English the language? of the nation, what does it mean to say an African writer would write in English? Yes. And now Apriya is also critiquing Achebe, right? Yes. So yes. this is a second critique of Achebe, but it's a very different, it's completely different, right? Mm -hmm. He's, yeah. His counterexample is Baldwin, it's Man with Bicycle, yes. it's uh, a Ben Okri, right? And yes. so I'm curious about your thoughts on these two very different types of critiques of the post-colonial and yeah. what which of these is African philosophy is yeah. okay so if it's not a Chebe is yeah. it a pair of the then we will have a, a cosmopolitan African of the contemporary world who's not a Chebe but still yeah is that or will it be the oral languages the sages so i heard you go very seamlessly from these different critiques and i can't put them together so i guess that's the source of my question yeah i think um thank you very much for 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 that um uh charu i think it's a very uh that's something that is a question of african philosophy itself that, that what you just pointed out, that multiplicity or that the fact that these discourses may not actually meet in the same way, that is a question of African philosophy because um, the, the question of what is African philosophy is also trying to, it demands that kind of, um, uh, what, is the what is the ontological framework that we can actually use to to describe what uh, African thought is. And so if I would follow you, I would say, well, uh, is it in the English language? Is it, uh, is it uh, Kwame Apia? Or is it in the indigenous languages and in oral history? Or is it, you know, my personal response would be that, um, uh, that uh, this is a very uh, the, the question. I mean, the question itself is pointing towards the methodology of African philosophy rather than what African philosophy is. So I would say that yes, Kwame Apia is an African philosopher, but what the methodology of African philosophy is is precisely about almost. Uh, continually challenging the ways in which we describe African philosophy. I don't know if that if that makes sense to you. I guess I need to read more before I can quite figure that out. But at least I'm getting a sense that in your mind, these are not oppositional, that these are actually in the same conversation. That is, when I hear you talk about them and when I read them, I think of them as opposites. So I'm trying to figure that out. 
I think they are. Uh, I think okay, great, perfect. Um, uh, Larry, you asked a question about whether I'm talking about man on bicycle. Yes, I'm talking about man on bicycle. Uh, and uh, the thoughts of of that. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that man on bicycle, or or was it? Um, so uh, also, also, I'm going very seamlessly through the, these writers because um, because I, I I think I've been trying to understand the intellectual history with, with that they come from. The intellectual history is not that difficult different. Um, Mudimbe comes from a very specific intellectual history. Kwame Apia comes from a very specific intellectual history. Kwesi Uredu also, and the writers that they're referencing also come from very specific intellectual histories that are not at all separate in the way that they are arguing that they are very different. Um, but I think there's something about um, what remains, the, the idea of something that remains to be resolved, that uh, and I now, I think, understand this to be one of the ways in which this question was articulated. African philosophy remains to be resolved. That's how some people would have articulated it because they were constantly trying to revise either Senghor, Senghor was trying to push back against um, a couple of writers who came before him, um, and so you have all these people who are trying to revise the, the, the ontologies and the ontological meaning of African philosophy. I found this quote by James Baldwin about the man on the bicycle and I thought I'll just share it. So yeah. it gets mm -hmm. added. To, because it's from an article by Apia about uh, this topic, so so then people can read it later if they want. No, you should read it. I think you you should read. So uh, uh, I'll just start with, with with Apia's own writing, and then I slowly jump into the, the quote. Yeah. The co-curator whose choice will set us on our way is James Baldwin, the only co-curator who picked a piece that was not in the mold of the African of primitivism. The sculpture that will be my touchstone is a Yoruba piece that carries the museum, museum label Man with a Bicycle, bigger one. Here is some of what Baldwin said about it. This is something. This, is, this has to got to be contemporary. He's really going to town. He's very jaunty, very authoritative. His errand might prove to be impossible. He's challenging something, or something has challenged him. He's grounded in immediate reality on the bicycle. He's apparently a very proud and silent man. He's dressed some of polyglot. Nothing looks like it fits him too well. So that's uh, the quote that Afia, Afia uh, lifted from uh, Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Julia, what do you think of this quote? Julia, you are, your, your mic is off. I, um, I haven't seen the actual sculpture. So it's difficult to um, give an opinion because I'm not sure what he's speaking about. My apologies. But I, let me think about it. And uh, I'll, I'll, I like the question. I'll, get, I'll respond later. Mm -hmm. I'll look if I can find the picture of the man on the bicycle easily. <laughs> okay. Really? I get, get a lot of pictures of men, men and bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> but not this one. 
it's a wooden it's a wooden sculpture of a man on a bicycle um cassidy are you still there is it okay yeah I've... and and cassidy do you have any thoughts on on what Baldwin is saying about um the man and bicycle in relation to our discussion Okay, great. Wow, okay, this quote. Okay, um, this, this direct quote from the, uh, from the PDF <laughs> itself might work if you <laughs> copy everything, but it will not work on, on normal browsers, nor in. <laughs> so I tried, it tried, it's, it's a wooden figure, it's, it's yeah. It's a, I can, um, Yes, it's the cover of Appears in my father's house. Ah. Yeah, I lifted the picture from his website. Okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll get it for you. Because I think it's... Um, Chara has sent a, a link to In My Father's House. Yes, that's, that's the actual, that's the picture. Superb. That's the picture. So, Julia, have you seen the picture? I'm, I'm just trying to open it. Okay. You can choose to enlarge the cover. It's kind of um, African the philosophy of culture, a man with a bicycle, and the clothes are very, um, I'm enlarging it, yeah. And this was um, Baldwin's favorite picture? I mean, uh, favorite yes, this, yes, Well, this was one of the objects that Baldwin selected for the exhibition and one of the ones he wrote okay. about with the description. I mean, is that a, that is a chair on his head? Is that a stool on his head? 